a very warm welcome from my end to Moonfear's Deal Talk episode today. My name is Stefan Powers, and I am the founder and CEO of Moonfair. Look, we had an event the other day in Vienna, and one of the guests was asking, what are you guys actually doing? Are you selling tickets to the moon? And obviously not. This is why I want to clarify very uh, shortly what we do. And what we do is simple. Uh, Moonfair is, uh, in the meantime, the largest direct-to-consumer platform uh, for private equity in the world. Uh, we are accessible in over 23 countries across the globe, eight offices uh, across Asia, uh, Europe, and the US. And we are spearheading what the industry calls the democratization of private equity phenomena. This is our mission. So what we do is we give private individuals and their advisors the opportunity to invest directly into some of the most sought after global private equity growth and tech funds for managers like KKR, Premiera, Insight or Silver Lake, just to name a few. And all this is starting at low minimums, depending on the jurisdiction at 50K euros. And this is all done through an entirely digitalized process. So if you would go to the Moonfair platform, it takes you less than minutes, less than two minutes to sign up. And then you can view all of our opportunities that have been highly curated and selected by our investment team. But pictures tell us more than a thousand words. And this is why uh, we take a quick look into a video to kick things off. That was the introduction video when we launched in India two weeks ago, one of the 30, uh, 23 countries that I mentioned. Today, I'm excited to welcoming Justin from Simpson as a guest for our deal talk. Uh, not only Justin is an outstanding private equity investor, but also he is a personal friend of mine. Justin is a managing partner and a member of the HG Investment Committee, the Realization Committee, and a member of uh, HG's board. Justin is also responsible for HG's Munich office. He joined HG in 2002, and he is currently a director of multiple portfolio companies, to name a few, Gen2, Minardo, or Caseware. He has led or co-led more than 25 investments since joining HG, and is a very experienced dealmaker. Prior to HG, Justin was employed by Goldman Sachs and Deloitte, and he holds a degree in economics and business administration from the University of Cologne. A very, very warm welcome, Justin. It's fantastic to have you here today. Thank you, Stefan. It's great to be here today on a Friday afternoon, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Justin, let's jump directly into uh, a couple of questions, and I want to start uh, really uh, with uh, HG, with your firm. And look, I've been following you obviously uh, since a decade now. Uh, HG has been extremely successful in establishing itself as a leading software and services specialist investor. So what made, and there has been some transition in the past, what made HG move into the sector uh, and how has uh, 2022 looked like so far for you? Mm. So um, 20 years, I'm coming up to my 20 year anniversary at HD this year. And over the last 20 years, the whole industry has changed dramatically and we have changed dramatically at the firm. The industry when I joined HD was a cottage industry. It was an investment club. It came together as a couple of partners who understood mostly chartered accounting and understood numbers and were doing deals together. And the whole industry um, uh, had to develop over time. Some have, and you named some fantastic names earlier in your intro. Some others haven't. And developing means specializing, and becoming a professional organization on your own behalf, and not just an investment club. 
But talking about missions on this on this journey, for me, the biggest mission has always been how do you get the balance right between outstanding returns and stability on the other side? Because you want to safeguard the money of your clients on the one side, but at the same time, you can't be too boring because they were expecting high returns as well. And high returns as a deal guy, which is still sort of a part of all the managerial jobs that I have, I really much, uh, very much enjoy doing transactions. But on the deal side, you only have your individual deal in front of mind. But as a firm and as a professional investment firm like HG, you always have to think fund. So funds means if you think about the risk uh, um, aspect of a fund, if you give me one euro and I give you the euro back tomorrow, then everything else comes second order because you, you're in the safe zone already and then you can work on the return. And that's right at the heart of what we do day to day. So putting that aside, the question is always, you're a software investor. And that's 100% right. We're the largest software investor in Europe. Uh, we're, we're amongst the top five um, on a global scale. Um, and we have been outgrowing in terms of AUM growth, most of our competitors over the last 10 years. But this focus on software, whilst we have been investing in, in software now for more than 20 years, even before I joined HG, got more pronounced in the last financial crisis. And now I sound like an old dinosaur and you sometimes have to tell war stories that people need to experience. Um, when I joined HG, I had already seen a couple of crises because coming out of university, I worked for, for firms like Goldman Sachs, as you just mentioned, we saw the Asia crisis, we saw the dot-com crisis, we saw quite some crisis in Germany, 15% unemployment rates and interest rates much higher than today. Uh, we saw Lehman crisis, and now we've got a new crisis. So you learn from every crisis and it sharpens your mind and it makes you feel much more as an owner of trust of your clients because a good client follows you through the crisis. But that also means you have to look after the money and looking after the money is look for a business model. And I'm answering your question, uh, which is as safe as houses on the one side, but gives you multiple avenues to develop uh, companies from a very stable base and to create value for the company and for the investors. So where do you find these businesses which have these characteristics? And these characteristics are all around no external dependencies, um, uh, be, it, be it from a macro side or be it from external uh, um, factors like a big competitor coming in and eating your lunch, be it on the technology side, which sounds funny for a tech investor, but we don't invest in disruptive uh, uh, business models, but we automate functions that exist, like payroll, tax and accounting, really interesting things where my wife would kick me if I would talk about it at a dinner party, but that's where you can make money. Um, and uh, uh, um, uh, that all combined in a subscription business model, where you wake up on the 1st of January and know where the money comes from, and not only your base, but ideally, you even see your gross out of the existing base, and then you can build on that. So the whole idea wasn't necessarily about investing in technology or investing in software, but it was all about where do we find these high quality, as we like to call them, triple A business models, where you can sleep really well at night and make a huge return on the other side when the, uh, when the morning starts. So we find these businesses in software and occasionally in tech enabled uh, um, uh, services. Yeah, and I deliberately say occasionally because we are as rigorous as we are with software businesses also on the services side. So putting that, that all uh, to one side, your question was, when did you focus? Yeah, and whilst we always did this, the last crisis, the last big crisis being the Lehman crisis really helped, helped us to sharpen our mind. Um, <clears throat> and that finally happened here in Munich because my partner colleague, Nick Humphries and I were sitting at a restaurant here in, in Munich called Schiffritz for, I don't know which reason. And we were sitting there back in 2009-10. And on the one side, we were saying, prices hurts, carry looked better yesterday than it does today. But we had the feeling we're still the winners. And then we looked at why were we the winners? Why did our companies came better through the crisis? Why weren't we sitting there sweating, but still enjoying dinner? And perhaps crying a little bit because we felt richer before the crisis. But then we weren't sitting there thinking, why well, somebody's putting the carpet under my feet. And the reason was when we started peeling the onion, really looked into the businesses which came through 
these crises without, uh, without any, uh, any pain. These businesses had, had all the characteristics which I just talked about. And therefore we said, listen, let's do this and let's do this only and not get carried away every time and say, I found something, it looks like we could make money, forget about that. Stick to your strategy, do only that and build your machine around that. Because if you do everything every day, always the same thing, you get better every day. You've got this classic flywheel, you get better every day. It's like a sports center. If you play golf or skiing or tennis, whatever it is, but if you do all of them at the same time, you might not be a pro in any of them. But if you do one, yeah, from the start of your life, as a kid, you play piano, you're a fantastic piano player, like you, Stefan, for instance, yeah? So that's, that's what we do. So it sounds very simple, but often the simple things are difficult because you need discipline, you need to force people, and in our industry, because everybody believes he's a hero, there's big ego out there in the private equity industry, people get disrupted because they go to a dinner party, they hear about a good business, they've got no idea about the business, they invest, sometimes you become lucky, but it's, that's, it's not a concept, yeah, it's betting. And we're not in the world of betting, we're in the world of investing, we're investing in clients' money, and the client's money in first base has to be safe, yeah, so nobody should lose money, and the second base is make great returns, and do that consistently, and with a machine, and not by accident, <laughs> yeah. So that was the starting point. And then over time, we built out this strategy and we built it out over three different funds. We built it out over uh, by now five offices. We built it out through 350 people who are on our payroll and a lot of people around it. And you're just seeing this flywheel effects uh, as, as you become better. Look, it's interesting because in retro perspective, this sounds very compelling and, and uh, intriguing. But if we think about it, you know, uh, if I, I've been investing in tech since 1996 or so, and, you know, post 9-11, people were saying tech is dead, you know, the dot-com bubble. Uh, then, you know, post Lehman financial crisis, people said tech is, is, is dead, it's not the right thing. Many people, again, say uh, tech is, is, is now suffering. Uh, and taking such a visionary standpoint in midst or just be after, after the crisis, uh, well done, and obviously it's paying off uh, in, a, in a tremendous way for, for HG. Look, I want to switch uh, gears quickly a bit and ask you, and you mentioned the current environment, and many of our investors, many of the members of the Moonfair community, of course, uh, as many others are, as well, are concerned. So what is, what are your views or the firm's view on the current, you know, uh, recession uh, that we are facing uh, what can we expect, you know, uh, this year um, and going forward have, for instance, you know, the compression uh, of valuations has it already really taken place? Is there more to come? Uh, is it now the time to invest? What, what's your view on this? Um, yeah, so I think there are lots of different views out there. So I can give you only my view, which is one, one of us housing crystal balls. Um, but as a starting point, I would like to look at our own portfolio um, and also picking, picking one seam up that you just mentioned, that is, is tech investing dead? I think it's a massive difference if you're investing into high growth horizontal business models. What is a horizontal business model? A horizontal business model is a WhatsApp, a Facebook. It's, it's businesses that have a global dimension. They have a global audience. And normally the winner takes it all. Think about internet search. In the past, we had Yahoo when I was young. There was Bing for Microsoft. Yeah, they, they burned billions. Today, there's Google. And people should think about how often did you use a different search engine than Google recently? There are quite a few out there, but nobody uses them. So what I'm trying to uh, tell you is that there are horizontal business models. You can make a fortune if you get them right, or you lose your money if you get them wrong. That's not what we do. So our word in tech is you go into vertical business models. You go into business functions, which you automate. Payroll. What is a payroll? A payroll occurs every month. People have to get paid. It's very complicated. The rules and the tariffs, everything changes all, all the time. It's right at the sticky end. A business goes bust. The insolvency lawyer gets the keys. The administrator looks after the business. As long as he keeps the business alive, he has to pay the people. So what do you switch off last in the value chain? These type of products, which are vertical, 
where you protect it, you're mission critical. I don't need to explain to you why there could be a market because the market exists. The only thing that we do, meaning our portfolio companies, is automating what exists. We're making things better. So the products we in our portfolio provide are high return on investment for clients. The client is taking white collar people who are expensive. Think about inflation. That's where it's happened. Or also happened before this crisis. So, and people are at demand and you're taking somebody who's a bookkeeper and I'm replacing him with a clever tax and accounting software. Yeah, and then you can go to the CFO and say, listen, we're saving money. Your return investment is high, take the product. And he takes it, he takes out the person who did it before, he becomes dependent because he hasn't got the human being anymore. He's relying on your product and that's why you're so sticking. So getting back to your question, if I look at my portfolio, in many cases, I see an acceleration. And why? Because people are taking the pencil and try to break it and say, how can I save money before buying a new pencil? And then the next question is, well, how can I do this? Oh, there's a tool which helps me to do it, which is the type of software that we, we're selling or the type of service that we're selling. And that's a big, big difference than if you get, come and say, hey, I've got a loss-making business, it's growing 50%. It will rule the world. We will be the global dominating factor. I just have to be careful that nobody else comes with even cheaper money, which has been the rat race, which we've seen over the last couple of years, which in our view was just distracting a lot of our portfolio companies from what it was about. And sometimes even I, I, I got calls from colleagues saying, hey, we should do this loss-making gross business. And there the discipline bit comes in and say, no, we're not doing that. Yeah. I want to have see businesses with often profit margins, uh, EBIT margins, or even cash flow margins in the 50s. Plus, not negative. Yeah. Um, so that's a long answer to your question. But if I look at my portfolio, I'm feeling as good as before the crisis. If I look at my private life and everything that's happening, happening on, on the world, I'm very scared because I do see a lot of factors which are really worrying. Would it be over to, tomorrow? I don't think so. I think it's here to last. I think there's a lot of things that got got wrong. We got wrong. We meaning as a community got wrong over the last ten years, which partly also got accelerated through COVID, which are now yeah, uh, coming crashing down. And and the the plane crashes were unfortunately, in my view, at least continue. And therefore, you have to adjust as a firm. Uh, which in many cases makes the discussions we, we, we just started on easier because you can tell people it's about <coughs> cash flow. It's not about only about growth. Um, and it sharpens minds and it gives you opportunity, of course. Yeah? And the opportunity bit is on different dimensions. First, of, of course, from the view of HG, our opportunity is to prove to the world that what we have been praying and what we have been telling people that we will come back with good returns on a good day but also on a rainy day is true. Secondly, the opportunity is, of course, because we're also in competition with all the great names out there to prove that we are better and deliver top quarter returns consistently and not once by accident, but consistently over uh, 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 um, uh, many funds. And then lastly, of course, the opportunity lies in finding great opportunities to invest new money, which isn't as easy, which comes back to your valuation question. Why? Because there's just scarcity of high quality business. There still is. And there's still a wall of money sitting on the shelf. So we are seeing, as we speak, transaction going by a very high multiple, uh, multiples, which feel a bit like yesterday's multiples. So that hasn't landed in the private equity market yet. And the biggest opportunity for us is that all our businesses are in platforms. We've got businesses like Visma, for instance, which we took off the stock exchange when it was a 400 million EV business. It's now 20 billion plus. And since we invested, we have bought more than 200 uh, businesses onto the platform. So it's a bit like a private equity machine in itself. And these add-on acquisitions arguably have become a lot cheaper and a lot more available through the crisis. So great. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, uh, which also goes back to, to tech being broken, there have been a lot of high quality people being drawn into businesses which still are, uh, have to prove that they will ever be profitable. And if they're not profitable, then 
there might not be as much cheap venture capital uh, chasing them. There might be not uh, enough money to pay these massive salaries and packages, which partly got destroyed because people don't get the option package and sweet equity that they were expecting. So it's a great opportunity for us to upgrade what you already have, which is good, but could become even better because at the end of the day, of course, the human factor is key. Um, uh, so, so we think there's there's multiple opportunity. Yeah, and as always, you can either put your head in the sand and say, "Ah, oh, yesterday was nicer," and I'm not going in, in front of the door because it could rain, or you can be inspired and go out and grab the opportunity. And I think uh, every crisis is also an opportunity. Justin, if we and uh, we at Moonfair spend a lot of time really analyzing data and, and content, and if you go back in time to uh, 2001, two. Then, of course, financial crisis, eight, nine. Uh, did the data tell us that uh, just dealing you know, with the start of a recession time and taking into account, of course, a four years investment horizon, these has been historically data driven the best vintages uh, uh, in, in the cycle of the past 20 years. So 2002 and then uh, eight and nine. Would you expect, uh, coming back to my question on timing, that again now is uh, the best time to invest in the years to come. If you if you are now trusting uh, your money uh, in HG fund and uh, that fund invests over a four years period, I think generally for the industry that should be true, because of course, especially in the time that you refer to, private equity has also been very opportunistic. Yeah, so you were all over the place to get the, the to get the dollar for eighty cent. Yeah, and you were looking for a distressed uh, strategic or somebody who just had to sell and then you could buy something cheap. Yeah. So as much as we would like to see it that, that way from an HG perspective, because the investing in high quality also comes uh, with a price. And that means these businesses should sell in a crisis, which is good because you've got the liquidity. But people don't sell it to you at a, at a bargain either. So what I'm trying to explain is the end in the market where we are is not like people are poor sellers normally because the quality of the business is so high, because there's so high cash flow, because these businesses are great when we buy them. Nobody's sitting there saying, Phew, I'm just losing my keys to the bank, so I better sell. Yeah? But generally, you're right. And generally, of course, at the beginning of a cycle or at the end of a cycle, the multiples should be lower and therefore your entry point should be better. At 100%. So if I was a betting man, then I would say investing today in private equity and also investing today in new funds of HG, the argument should be true that it's better than a couple of years ago. Having said that, if you look at our vintages from the years 2017 to today, most of the funds have delivered one times DPI or more, meaning people have their money back. So still there should be a sleeping way, even though yeah, the world is crazy at the moment. In many cases, these funds are ready in carry, meaning we have achieved the hurdle rate plus, which is good for investors, but it's also good for me as a manager of this firm because I've got a highly motivated staff. And that's a bit you shouldn't forget. I mean, the biggest risk in a, in a crisis is that you lose your people or lose the motivation of the people. And I today need my people to go after all the opportunity. So having a motivated team, as we have, is fantastic. Yeah, And then lastly, of course, if you, you, you should focus on the firms who don't have problems in their portfolio. Because every problem in the portfolio absorbs a lot of time from senior people. And you want the senior people to be on the pitch and, and shoot the next go for you, meaning investing the new money that you're given to them. You don't want to have your senior people looking after the dogs, which are underperforming. You have to change management. You have to cut costs. You have to negotiate with the banks. All of that you don't want because that's a distraction. Yeah, which goes back to the business model that we're driving. Keep away, keep away of the dangerous zone. Yeah, because that's just on all fronts risky. Why it's tempting. Yeah. It's like, like, like anything in life. I mean, of course, risk is tempting because risk also means often it's fun or there could be a big price if you get it right. But risk normally also means if it goes wrong, you've got a problem. So we don't do that. Boring.
So let me ask you, and some people really are concerned. Look, we, we saw this, I, I, at least you know, during my career, 2022 was probably one of the most busiest fundraising years ever. Uh, EQT just announced you know, a record first close of 15 billion CDNR. Um, the dry powder, as you know, is on record levels. Um, you had a very successful fundraising. Um, so people are asking, you know, how much of a risk is there? Some people, by the way, even say Ponzi scheme that we see more and more secondaries uh, between the funds. And uh, talking about HG, how much of a role do they play in your in your approach? Uh, so secondary taking over from a from a from another private equity fund and asset. Yeah. So um, I'm putting my my old dinosaur costume on again. When I started in, uh, in, in, in private equity, um, also we at HG, we were looking for primaries. We were often looking for primaries coming out of big corporates. I did a couple of bigger deals when I, when I was young at HG uh, in Germany, where you made a lot of money just buying a undermanaged, undervalued uh, business out of big corporates, turning these businesses around and then quickly selling them. So if you if you in that world, then this idea of a secondary doesn't exist, because the idea of a secondary is always where if HG is selling and Premira EQT whoever is buying, then somebody must be losing because because either I haven't done the job, yeah, because I should have optimized the business before selling, but optimizing a business also means on the other side there's nothing to go for because. It, Everything is done and I paid for it in a competitive auction. So, so what's the deal for the buyer? So the only thing the buyer can bet on is that they see more money in the business or in the industry. So it's a Ponzi scheme. And I find an even stupid, an even more stupid buyer on the next one, which then is a tertiary. But it's not true. Yeah. So that's the 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 the, the general logic, which is sort of true. But that's again not our world because the businesses that we bow, uh, uh, build are properly compounding. And this compounding character first needs to be proven. A lot of these businesses in the past at some point were uh, uh, negative because it takes time before you build a base of often millions of customers before this whole flywheel effect starts going. So back to the Visma example, I mean, that business uh, has 1.2 million customers today. You don't build these customers over, over life, uh, um, uh, overnight. But then again, once you've got these customers, you've got so much growth in your existing base, so you can take these businesses forward from there. And therefore, our view is that these type of businesses can grow over proper decades to a point that HG hates selling businesses. I mean, that's the bit, the bit that we really don't like. And therefore, we sometimes even sell from one front to the next, which was the same argument. You would say, well, that's even worse, talking about Ponzi scheme. And a lot of people are always jumping on it. But then again, if you look at our investor base, which is probably the, 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 the highest quality AP base on the institutional side that you could think of, these people have been on this journey with HG since more than 10 years, and they've probably bought into it. So you can either take the view where there's some clever journalist who claims it's a Ponzi scheme, or you could argue perhaps of the smartest investors, both institutional but large US, Asian family offices, yeah, um, who are sort of very loyal followers of the HG strategy, and hopefully was a reason. Yeah. But Just this, let's talk this, this whole secondary story, I think, is much more driven by this idea that. A business, there's nothing to go for on the cost side when you sell it, and therefore, why buy it? Yeah. Yeah. Very insightful. Thanks. Look, let's talk a little bit about Germany. And, and frankly, being German, uh, you know, I'm I'm very much concerned. Yeah? When you see what the macroeconomists are predicting in terms of GDP, negative GDP uh, decline next year, the best case to say I saw as minus one. And the range is as large as never. And the worst case, so to say, um, one institute came up uh, out of the four um, uh, with minus 7% uh, GDP decline. Uh, you are, um, you know, have made uh, numerous investments in, in Germany and you're also responsible for HG's uh, Munich office. What is your particular view on, on the German market? 
Uh, what shall I say, Stefan Amir? I think the Germans have made a lot of mistakes. Just I'm, I'm German, so I live in Munich with my, my three kids, and uh, uh, we're, we're happy here, but I'm concerned. Uh, but what do you expect if you give yeah, your military to the US, your finance to Brussels, your energy to Russia, and your exports to China? I mean, it's not much left. But joking aside, I think uh, Germany is on the other side still a powerhouse. And I think the long-term trends that we see um, globally towards energy efficiency, renewable energy, et cetera, should play well into the hands of German industry, which always has been the heart of Germany. So I'm also optimist, optim optimistic that in the medium and long term, they will get it right. And also we shouldn't forget that Germany, when you look at uh, uh, debt levels, but also stability. I mean, yeah, I mean, looking what what happens in the UK, et cetera, I think we, we complain a lot in Germany and the bid side in Germany is full of bad stories and very few good stories. So that, that sort of, yeah, the sentiment is really bad and people like to uh, have the doom and gloom uh, uh, view, um, but I think normally things turn out to be much better because I'm, I'm an optimist when it comes to the to, to Germany as a country and the system and the stability and the legal system, but also the motivation to 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 shovel yourself back into the green zone. Um, by the way, the same institution, the same clever people are now seeing seeing all the bad stuff. Uh, uh, didn't a didn't see it coming. Whereas I always have the feeling and pictures on the wall and why is the picture on the wall? I don't know where it comes from, but it will come as it did in the past, the crisis. Um, but also the, 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 the question for me is always, if you think you're right with your analysis and your projections, then why don't you start a hedge fund business, but instead are sort of locked away in a dusty corner? Yeah. Um, <laughs> So no, yes, but, you mentioned, but, uh, I think it's really it's very hard to read, but you could also see 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 quite a positive scenario going forward. But again, yeah. So if you ask me, what does it mean for your investments? Uh, make sure that that whatever scenario happens, uh, um, your your companies continue to grow. And Touchwood so far that's working extremely well with some acceleration even because uh, if people have time, then they can also think about their own their own machine and how they can improve that. And that only means they want to buy more software um, and, and use it as an opportunity. Yeah. So you mentioned the high dependency, uh, in particular of Germany uh, to, to other countries. And now in, in the frame of a new geopolitical landscape, of course, you know, we have these broken global value chains. Uh, and uh, the current crisis is, as you know, as good as I do, is, is a supply crisis. It's not a demand crisis. So it's very different from post-financial crisis where you could fix stuff. And also, uh, if you take COVID as a crisis by central bank intervention and government spend, this is yeah. very, very different. So those broken value chains globally, uh, and now talking about Germany, they have to be reconstructed, uh, whether it's in energy, whether it's in healthcare, in order to uh, uh, lead to insourcing. Some people even say, it will stop at least slow down globalization because uh, uh, countries do more um, uh, stuff themselves. Is there any opportunity from a, is this a, one of your investment themes from a software perspective where you say, wow, th this reshuffling uh, is offering uh, a lot of new opportunities that have not been out there uh, a year or two years ago? Sure, sure. I mean, everything that makes life more complex should be good for software and data. And then if you think about backbone software, which sort of tax and accounting, payroll, transport and logistic, et cetera, is, you're right at the heart of, of where things actually happen. Often these businesses in the past, because they were there first, because we shouldn't forget that the areas that we cover were the areas where people went first with software. So if you think about SAP and Oracle and the big names in software, Microsoft, then they went first into the office of the CFO to optimize processes. But often these first movers are also sitting on legacy systems. It's like the car industry. Daimler didn't come up and uh, was the first electric vehicle, needed Tesla to come in. Yeah, because Daimler was just stuck in the old world. And it's a bit the same in the software world because big established players, because they were sitting on a really rich and nice business, like the SAP sources world, 
it's very hard to move them into the new world. And the new world isn't something really exciting. It's a first of all a technology with with a uh, cloud and SaaS. But the SaaS means that people don't buy a license, but they're paying you like a newspaper on a monthly basis to use your service, which in, uh, in many cases is a stripped down service. So you don't get the package with the bells and whistles, but everybody gets pretty much the same product, which you can then scale dramatically. But coming back to your question, that also means that suddenly this information while sitting on the right things and the right topics, tax and accounting, payroll, compliance, transport, legacy. So all the stuff that really matters in business life was often sitting in the cellar on IBM mainframes, working on machines which had sometimes water cooling. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, they look like, like, uh, like diesel engines. Yeah? And these machines not only were buried away somewhere in the cellar and so old that even IBM didn't want to send you spare parts anymore, but you didn't get to the information. So coming back to your question, where we can really help us, if you've got modern systems who fulfill these basic functions, you can really help. So I'll give you a couple of examples from the COVID crisis, which in some way was also a crisis because the data was missing. At Transport, for instance, we've got more than a million trucks, which is a transport and logistic network for, for road transport in Europe, by far the largest. You could see where the lorries are. And if because COVID somebody shut the border because they don't let people going from Germany to Austria, you could tell Nestle where the yogurt is and if it would arrive in time at the supermarket. Yeah, but you could also use the system, which we then did, to tell the German healthcare system where the beds that you needed for COVID patients actually were, because nobody knew. And anybody who has been picked up in his life by, a, by an ambulance, hopefully not too many, they will know that the first thing that people do when they pick you up after a road crash or something is pick up the phone and call hospitals and see if you find a bed. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a joke, but that's what's happening. And that's the systems that we can automate with our, with our products from, from our portfolio. So it's, again, it's basic systems which happen every day. Yeah? Ambulance looking for a bed, people trying to organize beds for COVID patients, Laurie is standing with yogurt at the border. You don't know when they arrive at the supermarket. Information about your workforce, why people are now working from home, yeah? Uh, I don't know who, who he is. I'm a big organization, I've got 50,000 people. I don't know where my people suddenly are doing COVID, yeah? Because I'm sitting on old systems. So bringing transparency into a world which is even more complex every day is, is what we do. But what we don't do is reinvent the wheel and come with some funky toy which nobody saw before, yeah, TikTok or whatever. Yeah. Justin, one of the purposes of, of this, these deal talks is uh, that we really, we meaning the Moonfair community, uh, me personally, everyone who is listening into, want wants to learn from from the greatest deal makers uh, in the world. And I want to talk a little bit about in the investments and your investments and maybe starting with past deals. Uh, what was the first major successful deal that you have made and what made it so successful? Was it visible, so to say, uh, when you made the deal or was it luck at the end or uh, did, did you get a catalyst, so to say, that you didn't expect? Yeah, I, luck, luck always helps, That's no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> it's good if you have it. Um, uh, no, so, it was a deal which is completely, absolutely 100% different to what we do today. And still, I learned a lot, uh, um, uh, partly the hard way, but it was very successful. And what, what we did is we did a spin off, um, we backed a spin off of Rheinmetall. And Rheinmetall in Germany is known as a big defense company. And a big defense company had a little company called Hirschmann which in itself was a mini conglomerate existing of eight different businesses under one lid, all of which was different characteristics. And it had a, a very funny management setup because Heimatow being a defense business, once in a while gets a call from the Deutsche Bundeswehr saying, listen, we buy your tanks and you take our soldiers, which are looking for a job and coming out of Bundeswehr and want to have a good retirement job. And they did, but nobody wanted them. So they sent them off to Hirschmann in Stuttgart. <laughs> So we, we were confronted with a mediocre team and a mediocre business, which actually had so many parts which didn't fit together. And we had to be laser sharp in 
carving out the ones which were really valuable and filling them with life and new people and getting rid of the ones that weren't. And then we ended up selling the business in two parts at the end. So the two major parts and made seven times money after three and a half years, which was a really good return for clients. But also for me as a dear captain, a really interesting experience because the, the, the company wasn't one deer, it was a lot of deers under one lid. So you could learn a lot about uh, uh, um, a, how to do that, all the tax implications, a lot of negotiations with the banks during those times, so which parts are secured, et cetera. A lot of management change, a lot of strategic thinking, how to cut it and how to slice it and who to sell it to, because we sold all of it to strategic. Uh, and that was a great deal for clients, but it also was a great uh, um, experience for me as an individual in my early days of private equity. It was a 2003 deal. Uh, to learn, learn it, well, call it the hard way, because uh, it for sure wasn't a secondary from the setup. You first had to define what cash flow looked like, you know, talking about transparency. There, there's a famous <clears throat> quote from uh, you know, the founder, co-founder of Blackstone, and probably you know it, Justin uh, Stephen Schwartzman. Uh, he was asked in an FT interview, what makes Blackstone so successful? And his answer was pretty bold, but he said, uh, look, we do see things that others don't see. That was his answer. Um, so when you go back now to, you know, not every deal, of course, plays out the way uh, you, you want it. Are there any mistakes you've made and, and insights out of those mistakes that you can share with the audience, um, you know, to avoid um, um, and this deal being done the next time, so to say. What are what are the learnings, lessons learned in terms of and generally? Generally, we always make mistakes. Of course, we do. Yeah. Um, ideally, you don't make the same mistake twice, and ideally, you don't make too many mistakes. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the biggest mistakes we normally do is that we that we aren't fast enough when it comes to pushing through change, because of course we're we're also nice people. Um, which is also partly the brand that we have as HG. So people want to work with us, which is good. But on the other side, you also give people quite a long grace time if things aren't working out. And if you overlay that with the type of businesses we back, you've got the time. Yeah. So if you back highly cyclical businesses, uh, um, which, which can be sort of different one month later, which our business can't, just because it's a completely different business model, then you don't have the time. In our world, you normally have the time and you've got good managers, but you might not have the absolute best managers. So making this management change is something where we for sure have made mistakes in the past and we weren't rigorous, decisive enough and fast enough. But that's part of the learning, of course, as an organization. Mistakes in terms of doing deals which then turn badly. I had one case which nearly derailed. Uh, it was a company called KVT based in Zurich. It was a high margin, sort of 40% EBDA margin producer of C parts. That was when we were still investing into businesses, which was a real product. And a C part has finally a lot of characteristics of what we see today, but was relying on a uh, on a quite a cyclical industry, which was, I mean, not one, but, but sort of every industry which uses this part. It's called an expander. Time's too short to explain, but it's a tiniest part which goes into all kinds of machinery and it's super high margin and absolutely mission critical so we liked all that and we looked at it at the time and said well because you're in the truck industry and hydraulics and uh, solar panels and car industry and you're all over the place with your product so yes there will be cyclicality but it's evenly spread globally but also across so many industries that should be okay it wasn't okay at all because what happened was Lehman went bust. People stopped ordering and they properly stopped ordering, not only because they didn't produce anything, but people had time. And people looked into their shelf and said, ah, I've got a couple of expanders. So don't buy any new toilet paper because I've got toilet paper and I want to save money. And you have this classic bullwhip effect and the market was very hot until Lehman people were storing products, which by the way, people are doing now as well. Yeah, people are taking whatever they get because everybody has a view, I'm not getting what I need. So even 
electric uh, installers in, in in Munich start sort of storing cable in something instead of just ordering it. And then when people figure out that it's available and there's no demand for my product, they totally stop. So what happened then was sales went from 3 million per week to 1 million. And not for one week, but it stayed 1 million. And we were operating with seven times EBTA debt, which went from seven times EBTA to 18 times EBTA debt overnight. And I was sitting in Bahnhofstraße in Zurich uh, with the famous uh, Swiss banks who had put leverage to work and were panicking and had to explain to them that we would roll up our sleeves and sort it out and get it right again. Uh, but therefore, they couldn't pull the covenants. And because business was so cash flow strong, they were okay with that. And they didn't want to manage themselves. So they said, okay, let's give it a try. Nothing to lose. Uh, and then we did, and the banks got their money back uh, 24 months later, all of it, and our investors got their money back as well. But it was written off to zero three months after investing. And Stefan, you, knowing it from your experience at KKR, the statistics tell you that if a business gets written off to zero, the chance that it ever comes back are close to zero. Yeah. Um, so that was... Again, a, a war story and, and a story of the past, of course, but that sort of sharpens your investor mind. And of course, you learn a lot through through cases that don't go well. Justin, thanks a ton for, for sharing. This is really, really insightful. Look, in times of crisis, uh, there, there's no other time where leadership is needed more. And I want to talk a little bit about leadership. You're, of course, the leader of HG, but you are also observing many, many uh, successful leaders, CEOs in your portfolio companies. Is there anything that you can share with us, what you have learned from them, any particular leader, you know, who particularly interested um, and impressed you uh, when you um, when you observe their behavior, their reactions uh, on, on crisis, uh, the speed, whatever it is? Yeah. So funny. I mean, and I can tell you, I can give you a lot of names, but but the ones that impressed me most is the ones that run extremely successful businesses, but wake up in the morning and try to keep their own organization in crisis mode. Always being in the front foot, waking up, and no matter how good it is, and no matter how successful they are, there's always the 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 message to the troops to keep them alive and keep them really alert and keep them really on the front foot and driving it and not driving it in terms of standing on the stage and giving huge pictures, we conquer the world and sort of the dream force in San Francisco type presentations, but instead going into the troops, being really close to the troops and making sure that everybody understands that you, you have to defend your competitive advantage every day in the week no matter how successful you are. And that is even harder if you are in the type of businesses where we invest in, where you should, at the beginning of the year, not only see your revenue, but you should see your revenue um, uh, plus 15%. And we always talk about net, <clears throat> net retention rate of NRR of 115. So you have to think about, you're a CEO, you run a business with, I don't know, 40, 50% cash flow margin, and you wake up on the 1st of January and you see your revenue plus day one. And still, you want to go into the shop on the 2nd of January and say, guys, yeah, the hangover from New Year's over. And now we, we, we start all over again and are really, really sharp and try to improve every day. And this improving is also important. And that's the next, next answer to your question, because this improving not only means having a great vision, but it's all about execution. So the building a machine that is executing on a rigorous way every day in the week, those are the best, uh, best uh, private equity managers. And everything else follows from that. Yeah. Justin, on this one, because HG is obviously you know, investing a lot of in, into high growth businesses and over the lifetime of the investment, suddenly it's 2x or 3x uh, the original size. Uh, how do you make sure, are there any processes that you apply to make sure that your management teams are growing with the growth of the company. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very different. So, 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 uh, uh, first of all, uh, Stefan, just to get that right, um, we for us, growth is 20%. So on average, our portfolio grows 
call it 20 percent but do the simple math if you grow top line 20 percent and you've got a 50 percent uh, EBTA margin you grow bottom line 30 percent so and if you take that and you put a little bit of leverage on top then you get to the returns that we would love to see yeah but that doesn't mean that you still don't want to have an eye on it and continue growing 20 percent and this 20 percent grows should be ideally in a business that where you can in brackets play with it because you know every marketing dollar that i invest has the following payback every new sales rep that i invest in he's got this payback so you can manipulate your growth according to where you are in the cycle which is also important because you see the cost of the cost of goods sold, the cost of of uh, uh, new revenue vis-a-vis vis -vis my profitability. So of course, in times like today, we're even more cautious to invest in growth as long as we don't need to. Yeah. So assuming that you stay at the 20% and you know you're taking a bit of a bet to invest in even more salespeople to get it to 25, vis-a-vis -vis securing your profitability and your cash flow. We're currently more in the stage of the market where we are secure your cash flow and use your cash flow not only to pay back debt, but to go out and buy, which might be a better investment. So that's the general playbook, which we always play across our portfolio companies. And back to what I said right at the beginning, if you've got one playbook, then you know how to play this playbook. Yeah. So, so and then, then back to your question, of course, businesses over time scale and not everybody scales, which by the way, is also true for our business at HG. Not every employee scales, not every partner scales. Yeah, um, um, some people don't want to, some people just don't have the skills to do so. And that's true in business life as well. So we do actively uh, change managers on that journey, of course. Yeah, but then again, it's also, a big advantage if you've got 50 companies like we have, which all pretty much look the same, because you then know what good looks like. It's really hard to change a manager if everything is different. Yeah, you've got this industry and this industry and this business model and this industry. You've got growth, you've got restructuring, you've got all. I mean, I'm, I'm always wondering how people are so skillful that they can do all of that. My brain is surely too small to do that. And therefore, we, we focus on one thing and try to be as good as possible. Yeah. Justin, allow me to ask you, and we are approaching the end of our session, uh, a few personal questions. Um, one of them is, what advice would you give your younger self? So when you think 20, 25 years back, uh, Justin, at the age of 20, what is, what, is there anything you would change, anything you, you would, would advise yourself? Yeah, I tend to be a very impatient person, but I think if you come out of university, and I mean, that's now a long time ago, but still, um, I do remember that one was extremely impatient. Yeah, so I think it's this impatient leads to, I know how it goes, why don't people let me to? And I think this experience bit shouldn't be underrated. I think experience, in, like, like today, sort of having seen a lot of crisis, having seen a lot a lot going on, having seen a lot of different situations, etc. I mean, you build on this experience throughout your life, which is hard to understand as a young person, but it's hugely valuable. Um, so that's the number one advice. The number two advice, which goes a bit hand in hand, is this impatience can lead to people being very hoppy, as you say in English, so going here, going there, going that, backwards, forward, what do I actually want to do? I think it's very important, why it's very hard to say, this is what I really want to do. And the first question that people should ask themselves is, do I want to be a principal or do I want to be an agent? And that's a hard one, but it's right at the heart of it. So not everybody who says he wants to be a principal wants to be a principal. Not everybody who says I want to be the boss of a firm wants to be the boss because it can be quite lonely. Yeah? So, so I think those are very fundamental questions which go far beyond the skill set and very much to, to the heart and your own human being. Yeah. Because I think once you understand that, then you can you can slightly plan your career. Yeah, instead of sort of dreaming that you actually want to be a principal, was you really like to be an agent. And that's that, that's absolutely fine. It's not a rating, it's more what you want to do in life. So that's I think it's very hard and perhaps easier uh, uh, to say uh, um, uh, after after 25 years coming out of university. 
But I think just looking back, I think that would be the advice that I would give to my, my kids when they come out of university, hopefully at some point. Thanks for sharing, Justin. Look, HG's story is without any doubt a very entrepreneurial one. And you as a managing partner, of course, you have an entrepreneurial DNA. Have you ever thought about, you know, uh, becoming an entrepreneur and setting up your own business? You've seen so many great business models, so many great entrepreneurs during your private equity time. Was this there at any point in time a desire to do something entirely on your own? Uh, yeah, for sure. It's uh, being an inpatient private equity professional coming through the ranks. Of course, before Lehman, so a long time ago, before I became partner at HG in 2008, you have the feeling where this is easy. I can set up my own private equity firm, which goes back to experience. Because, because A, it's not easy to set up a private equity firm, and it's got more than just being a skillful deal guy, because it's got a lot of components which you have to bring together. Uh, and also um, the reputation and the in-house experience shouldn't be underestimated. So I forgot about that idea, luckily, and stayed with a, a fantastic firm being HG and uh, was lucky that people at some point said, listen, now we give you the responsibility to take this business to the next level. But at that time, being a youngster and being sort of ambitious, I always said, wow, I could, I could do HG 2.0. Luckily, I didn't. But if you ask me, could you do anything else? And the answer would be clearly no, because I don't know anything else in private equity. When you think about the past 12 months, and let's take the war out of the equation, any um, surprises, anything that has surprised you uh, that you absolutely didn't expect? Um, well, in first place is that people are so surprised. It took me... I, I, I mean, I couldn't tell you where the crisis came from, but but we did expect the crisis to happen anytime soon. So I was surprised to hear from people that they were surprised. And I was surprised that people also had the feeling that, I mean, Ukraine is an accelerator for sure, but I think this whole COVID has damaged a lot of supply chains in a way uh, that, that, uh, that uh, it just takes time to sweat out again. Yeah. It's a bit like stopping a nuclear plant and expecting it to run and hum smoothly the next day. Yeah, I mean, just, just look at I mean, it's, it's, it's it should be basic, but just look at the chaos in European airports this summer. And the same chaos that is happening in airports because of suitcases, which isn't a very delicate product, uh, happens in all types of supply chains and has caused a lot of damage. And I was always surprised that people didn't, didn't have the feeling where there must be a reason that I go to a shop and don't get the product. What's the reason behind that? And how long will it take? And what is, what, what, what's the damage that is currently being caused through the whole of COVID? Yeah. So that was a bit of a surprise for me. Um, and of course, the Ukraine war was a surprise. Yeah, because we all, yeah, yeah. I mean, I do remember when I was a child, we went to the wall and was a school class and had a look into the enemy's country. Um, but that felt very much of a story of the past. Yeah, so, and, and of course, I mean, with hindsight, one is surprised that uh, a lot of, in my view, bad de political decisions have been made, but it's always easy to say that with hindsight. Look, Justin, this has been terrific, and thank you really so much for, for being with us today and for all the insights that you shared. And towards our audience, if you're interested to learn more you know, about Moonfair, about future deal talks, um, sign up at uh, www.moonfair.com and join our community of more than 40,000 investors globally. As in, for your information, our next deal talk will take place on November 9th at 2 p.m. And we will host Jeff Lieberman from Inside Partners. And as you might know, Inside Partners is also an institutional investor backing us so that we'll be hopefully very insightful. Thanks a lot for listening into today and hope to see you at our next e-talk. Thank you very much. See you soon. Thank you.